I am Warren Sprouse. This is the Bible Forum. We're here every Sunday night from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time. We're looking at life through a biblical lens. Tonight we're looking at mysticism, the Mahdi, and the event that will trigger World War III. Ryan O'Hare, writing for something called Mail Online, writes about mysticism. Studies, he says, have found that the dialing down of the brain's inhibition, that is the ability to restrict or to protect, boosts mysticism. Can you say Eastern meditation? Um, you know, sit cross-legged for 15 or 20 minutes, recite your mantra, and your blood pressure will go down, your body will be reinvigorated, your brain will be stimulated. Yeah. Sitting still, praying will do the same. Sitting still, quietly, will do the same. What does the meditation do? It dials down the brain's inhibition. Researchers in the U.S. and New Zealand looked at war veterans given uh, CT scans and questionnaires. They found the damage to the frontal uh, and peri, how do you pronounce that, parietal lobes. Uh, this is the area of the brain concerned with bodily sensation. Increased mystical experiences. These regions are linked to inhibitory functions, suppression of which appears to open doors of perception, exposing us to the mystical. From shamanic ceremonies to connecting with a higher power through meditation, entering into the world of the mystical can be down simply to our brain's ability to just let go. And that's the difference between Eastern meditation and Biblical meditation. Biblical meditation is not just letting go. It is meditating on the Word of God. It is purposeful. It is putting information in. It is structured. The other is just zoning out. According to scientists, our ability to enter into such mystical experiences is governed by one of two theories, either push or pull. The push involves a single area of the brain, oddly called a God spot. Whereas the pull argues that suppression of inhibitory function opens up the brain to mystical experiences. So push, taking the Word of God and putting it in with your meditation, moves you toward God, while pull, emptying yourself that it might escape you, opens you up to the occult. Throughout history, many people have claimed to have had mystical experiences, often reporting that they felt deeply spiritual connections, uh, which then left them permanently changed. Listen when your pastor or someone else tells you that Eastern meditation is spiritually dangerous. Native Americans use drugs and heat, peyote and sweat lodges to induce an altered state of consciousness. In that state, they saw and heard all sorts of things. Being animists, they interpreted all this as being in touch with the powers that govern the universe, when in fact they were hallucinating. And worse, opening themselves up to the occult. This is the difference between occultic meditation and biblical meditation. The positive, we read, we think, or recite Bible verses that push the things of this world to the back of our mind, in effect, pushing God to the front. The Eastern meditation is just the opposite. Pulling in and away from reality. Using a mantra to close out conscious thinking opens us up to who knows what. 
In recent years, false teachers have deceived millions into thinking this sort of meditation is biblical and therefore good, healthy. The argument is that it helps our physiology. The other argument is, doesn't the Bible teach meditation? Well, yeah. Why? There you go. This is how they expose the ignorant and the, the gullible to destructive practices. Because if you believe Eastern meditation to be a biblical idea, then whatever comes to mind while you're in that state has to be from God. And if it's from God, it is His Word, which means it has authority. You have to listen to it. You have to obey it. It is infallible. Can't make a mistake with this. It is inerrant. No errors anywhere in the structure. You must follow that instruction. Anything less is sin. With all that in mind, we enter into the world of the Islamic Mahdi, the genesis of Islam is literally surrender, submission. It's what the word means. Historical testimony speaks of an insecure 40-year-old man named Muhammad who goes off into a cave to meditate. Now, this is Eastern meditation, the pull. It's 600, 600 to 700 A.D. It's Arabia, a time when Arabians were pagans, worshiping a multitude of gods and goddesses, 360 to be exact, one for each day. The key feature in their religious belief was Hindu meditation. They worshiped a multitude of gods. Muhammad's father was named after their family god. His name was Allah. That was the moon god, the family's god. He continued to follow the god of his father as well as venerate the black stone, which is still featured in the Kaaba in Mecca over in the east corner. The Kaaba is a place of worship that Islam believes was either built or rebuilt by Abraham and Ishmael. As Judaism and Christianity focus on Abraham's second son, Isaac, Arabs focus on Abraham's first son by the Egyptian slave girl, Hagar. His name, Ishmael. In Muhammad's time, Arab custom incorporated the stone cult and involved rubbing sacred stones together for divine assistance. This type of shamanic practice has been documented among many cultures throughout the world. For instance, an uh, Amicelic Eskimo initiate is told to isolate himself in a lonely place and there rub two stones together while waiting for the significant event. Another technique in shamanism for obtaining a guardian spirit involves location. The best way to acquire a guardian spirit is in a remote place or in a wilderness. The location may be a cave, the top of a mountain, the, to uh, the, the um, top of a tall waterfall, or in an isolated trail at night. Spending many days in caves in an attempt to contact his guardian spirit, early Islamic writings tell of Muhammad eventually achieving his first revelation. One of Muhammad's wives, Aisha, narrated the events as recorded in the Hadith. She wrote, And then the want of seclusion became beloved to him. He used, he used to seclude in the cave of Hira to worship for many days and nights before going to see his family and take provision for that. Then he would come back to his wife, Khadija, to make his food likewise again till suddenly the truth descended upon him while he was in the cave of Hira. Tabari, the Islamic historian, wrote a modern translation of Aisha's narration in English, and he says, Gabriel was violent toward him. The terror-stricken Muhammad immediately thought himself to be possessed by a jinn or a possibly a poet or a madman. Muhammad was so distraught after such events that he often would attempt to commit suicide by jumping off a mountain or cliff. However, the spirit entity always intervened to stop him. 
This description is not unlike other similar encounters with demons, spirits. Among the South American shamans, a spirit, Pasuka, appears to the candidate in the form of a warrior. The master spirit being immediately begins to strike the apprentice, the shamanic candidate, until he falls to the ground unconscious. When he revives, his body is completely sore. This proves that the spirit has taken possession of him. Ultimately, whether immediately or subsequent time, the spirits of any occult art will eventually manifest or reveal themselves in a violent manner. Muhammad apparently experienced this indoctrination by his spirit guide. When we look at the vicious nature of fundamentalist Islam, it's hard to see anything attractive. There doesn't seem to be any grace in that system. There doesn't seem to be any of our God in that system. It certainly isn't a religion of love, grace, or mercy, which begs the question, which one is God? Allah or Jehovah? The God who loves with an everlasting love, giving his only begotten son for our sin? Or the God who demands submission at the point of a sword? Or perhaps it's both. And where is Islam headed? Where is Allah taking his servants? Well, the answer in Islam is toward the twelfth imam the Mahdi, the one who will usher in the hidden man, literally the divinely guided. The importance of this figure is emphasized in both Shia Islam and Sunni, although there are significant differences. For the Sunni, this Mahdi is not yet born. He will be born in Medina. His father's name will be Abdullah. For the Shia, He's been in hiding for over 1147 years, living in what is called oculation, hidden from human view. Either way, he will be revealed when certain signs appear. A true believer, therefore, will work to see that he appears sooner rather than later. We are watching the division today in our newspapers. The Sunni Arabs are in Turkey, Pakistan, Egypt, in the Arab Emirates, and more. The Sunnis are more moderate. The Shia inhabit Iran, Iraq, Bahrain, Azerbaijan, and more. The Shia are more extreme. There are more Sunnis than Shia by a large percentage. But Shia are more politically and militarily aggressive. Why? Because they're working to bring about the hidden body. For the Shia, he's not yet born, and the circumstances of that birth are completely out of their hands. They want him as well, but there isn't anything they can do. ISIS is led by men who consider themselves the only true representatives of Imam Mahdi on earth, as long as he remains hidden. According to Iranian Revolutionary Guard Commander Major General Mohammad Ali Jafari, Iran has prepared almost 200,000 young men in countries across the Middle East to help with the arrival of the Mahdi. They feel like one of the major blocking points for the Mahdi's return is Israel. And that's one reason why they feel they must destroy Israel. The Islamic Republic of Iran was founded by Shia Safavid, Safavids from Terman in 1501, using the 12th Imam as a political figure. The goal was to have a forced Shiite identity where they could morally separate themselves from the more liberal Sunnite Turks of the mighty Ottoman Empire. What is going to trigger all of this chaos? Well, the true believers are supposed to, required to, prepare all the conditions of the earth for the Imam's return, which will be according to the Shiite sect after the following signs. Number one, before the Imam's appearance, 
the people will be reprimanded for their acts of disobedience by a fire that will appear in the sky and a redness that will cover the sky. It will swallow up both Baghdad and Kufa. People's blood will cover their destroyed houses. Death will occur amid their people and fear will come over the people of Iraq from which they will have no rest, a, a reason for Iran's nuclear program. A nuclear program to do what? To set off bombs that will blow in jets of fire and plumes of smoke as a kind of backfire? I don't know. It didn't make sense to me. Second to that will be an insurgence by the Sufyani, a descendant of Abu Sufyan, who was one of, the, one of Muhammad's enemies. This will start from Palestine and Jordan, and his reign of tyranny will span the Middle East from Iraq to Egypt. Do you know who else, at the end of the age, according to the scriptures, is going to be operating from that area of the world? The rider of the white horse, the man of sin, who becomes the Antichrist coming to put down rebellion and make things safe and protect Israel and, and the economy. Thirdly, there will be a loud call from the sky to announce the hidden imam's reappearance. He will come at a time when there is great confutation. <laughs> nice word, 50 cent word, a lot of nonsense going on. Intense disputes and violent deaths. Before Imam Mahdi emerges, an intertribal fight will take place. In the same year, Hajis, those who complete the Hajj at the Mecca, will be looted and a battle will erupt in Mina, which is near Medina, in which many people will be killed. One has to go back to the last celebration there at uh, Mecca when so many people were killed and make these people wonder what was going on. The Euphrates will disclose a mountain of gold. Then there will be an emergence of the Sufiana. These are vicious people who will wreak havoc on the region. The Bible talks about the Euphrates drying up. It talks about millions of demons being released from the Euphrates. The parallels with biblical prophecy are clear. But the distinctions are dramatic. In the Bible, men are seeking to gain control of an out-of-control global situation, a situation brought about by the removal of God's restraint. That restraint is wrapped up in the church, the bride of Christ, which has been miraculously removed from the earth, leaving a spiritual vacuum into which Satan can then march. It appears he will move with a two-pronged attack. The Eastern world will uh, is out to create enough havoc so as to bring about the twelfth imam and destroy Israel. The Western world is out to tamp down the chaos and gain control. How close are we? Jesus said for Israel to watch for the rise of nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, presumably in and around Israel. A time of great famines and pestilence, which generally follow wars, as well as earthquakes in a multitude of different places, and, and all of these are but the beginning of sorrows. Today we are watching a global economic collapse. We are watching Islam on the march, carrying out jihad, an independent legal judgment. Western nations overwhelmed with refugees from Syria and Iraq. Eastern nations fighting for control of the Middle East and religious domination. Israel building a wall all the way around their country. Persia, Iran, supporting Hamas and Hezbollah with nuclear ability. Turkey and Saudi Arabia talking about sending troops into Syria. Russia allied with Syria, bombing rebels. And the West, 
overrun with refugees, trying to stay out of the fight, knowing that if Western, that is American soldiers, start killing Russians, the game is on. So how close are we to the coming of Jesus Christ? We are always at least seven years out. We are only waiting for the church to be removed. And then we'll know that the clock has started. It could be more than seven years after the church is removed. But the world is always only seven years from when Jesus comes. Today we're just waiting, humanly, and we're waiting for a trigger event. Islam is not waiting for a trigger event. The Sunni Islam, sorry, the Shia Islam are out to create the trigger event. Keep your eyes open, watch that eastern sky.